Now this morning, uh, what I want to share with you is something that uh, is not easy. Now just in, in, in surface, living Christian life is not easy. Uh, following Christ is not an easy process. Uh, living a life that embraces the gospel it is not easy simply because gospel, the message of gospel, as easy as it sounds, it took a path and agony to accomplish the meaning of gospel. And hence, to live that truth, to live that gospel is quite difficult. And one word that we quite often hear is to live a holy life. A holy life. And what I want to title this morning my message is Pursuit to Holiness. Pursuit to Holiness. As I was pondering on this, uh, I fell upon this book card that uh, I know my wife got this from a, a women's conference that she attended. And it says, the difference between toothbrushes and Christians. You heard that right. I'm going to read it. This is uh, adapted uh, from Nikki Gangami. I hope I said that right. My toothbrush is holy. That's right. My toothbrush is holy. What? Now give me a chance to explain, she says. When I say my toothbrush is holy, I am saying that it is set apart or dedicated for a specific purpose. Amen? You are supposed to say amen if you use a toothbrush in life. My toothbrush is only used by me and only for the purpose of cleaning my teeth. Hopefully you brushed your teeth before coming here today. Amen? Good, good. You're, you're, you're joining the program. Good. Did you let some random person use your toothbrush? You don't say amen to that. No. You probably also did not decide to use your toothbrush to clean the toilet or something else other than your teeth, right? Right. If you answer no to both of these questions, then you are quite possibly agreeing with me that your toothbrush is wholly set apart for a specific purpose and a mandate over it. You are having difficulty to say amen. So how do you define holy? The word holy is a normal word that is often instills a special status to an object, an individual, and also to God. We use it often, but we, do we really know what holy really means? When something is referred to as holy, it means it is dedicated or set apart for a specific purpose. In the Bible, things that are holy have been dedicated or set apart for God's or dedicated to be used for God's purposes. This is the essence of something being holy. And she moves on. See, my toothbrush is holy in a sense because it's set apart for a specific purpose. But as Christians, what do we mean by being holy, being set apart? Is when we think about holiness, we need to go one step further and think in God's terms. Because setting apart is not just we willfully, as humans, setting apart something for our own benefit. But being holy and set apart for God is being holy to fulfill God's purpose in our life. Having said that, and that really pondered quite a few thoughts on that topic. Pursuit to holiness. As a key passage, I want to invite you to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. As the writer pens it down this way, it says, Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification, as it is in the NASB, New American Standard Bible, in some versions it says, and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Pursue peace with all men and your desire to be holy, your pursuit to be holy, without which no one will see the Lord. It is a mandate, it is imperative for us to live a life holy. Why? Because He is holy. To see God, to have a relationship with God. I want to break it down in three aspects. Of course, there's much more a broad aspect when you define and explain and understand the significance of holiness and living a life that is holy or pursuit to holiness. Number one. It is personal. It is subjective. What, I, what do I mean by that? You are not asked to be holy or live a life that is holy 
because you're forced on or somebody else asked you to or the church preaches about it or your parents tell live a holy life. When I talk about a holy, what am I talking about? A life that is set apart, that makes it unique of your relationship and walk with God. Just like I read a little while ago what Ms. Gangemi said. Being set apart, being separate, being called for a specific purpose. And we'll talk more about that. But the pursuit to be holy is personal. Is my willful desire to pursue that journey. It is subjective. God is holy. There's nothing that changes in that. And he does not need to be any more holier to help us understand holiness. There's nothing more that Christ needs to do so that we feel, now I can follow Christ because so far the standard wasn't that good that I think I can follow holiness because of all the sin that I've done, I don't think I can get to there. So there's something more that needs to be done. No, not at all. Romans 6.22, Paul says, But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefits, resulting in holiness, sanctification. And the result, outcome, is eternal life. If you see that, you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, so you derive your benefits. And if you have medical coverage, some of you have it personal, some of you have family coverage. When you have a family coverage, there's a primary in that. For a while, my family and I, I was the primary. We had the uh, Obamacare, which is, which is commonly known. And we switched. Now my wife is the primary because it comes through her employment. And every time we carry that word, what it means is we are covered family because of an umbrella benefit that comes through her purpose and employment at a workplace. And through that, me and the kids enjoy that benefit that is specifically for us. The verse as we read, if you can put that up on the screen again. Having understood that you have enjoyed this freedom, being released from the clutches and grip of sin, and now enslaved to God. You see a paradox there. A paradox meaning a, 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 a switch in, in how you understand that word. You are freed. That means you were enslaved. You have freedom. You were once slaves of sin and flesh. But now you are freed from sin and enslaved to God. The true context and meaning between a slave and a master is you have a covenant, you have a relation, you are obliged to serve and to live. And the reason you are freed from sin is not just you live freely, but you live freely under the commandments and the instructions of the one that you commit your life to. Therefore, you are enslaved to God by the means of being free from sin. And through this process, through you and I committing, giving our heart, declaring that I am a sinner, there's nothing I can do to cleanse myself, but embracing the cross and the blood that was shed for us, just what we heard a little while ago, and, and committing ourselves to God, understanding that the only way I have meaning and hope in life is to embrace Christ Jesus. Yes, you know all that. You derive your benefit. What is the benefit? What is the package? This benefit of living a holy life, we'll talk more about, results in your holiness, in sanctification, in cleansing, in reminding yourself that you are made whole, you are made clean by the blood of Christ Jesus. But living in that journey, let me go further on, living in that path of holiness, that pursuit of holiness is personal between you and God. It is very important for us to understand that. Why am I emphasizing this? Quite often we live a holy life because somebody asked us to. We dress the way we dress or we walk the way we walk or we talk the way we talk because our pastor or our Sunday school teacher or our parents or society defines it.
deeply, truly inside, if I am a person that embraces the truth of the gospel of Christ Jesus, it is my responsibility to pursue the one that showed it all, the one that is holy, and therefore to take the time, the effort, the sacrifice to live a holy life because that is what he has asked me to do. Secondly, this pursuit of holiness is full of promises. You hear this word often, promise. The word of God is full of promise. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, the second half of 16 starts off in this manner. Yeah, the second part onwards. For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them. Promise number one. I will walk among them. Number two. I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Keep going. Therefore, come out from their midst. Which midst? The one that serves idols. The one that does not declare Christ as their Savior. The community, the people that denounce what God is. And therefore, you being a chosen generation, you being a community that serves God, pursuing holiness, this is the promise that I give to you. So come out of that midst and do not touch what is unclean and I will welcome you. I want you to understand that phrase. You and I are not in God's presence because we chose to be good and clean. Listen to me very carefully. You and I are in God's presence because of what Christ chose to nullify what is dirt and sin through which we have a pathway, we have a passage. You get that this morning? We are not who we are and we don't declare ourselves Christians because we know a bunch of ways to stay away from bad things. Because I guarantee each of us, each of us have so much to reflect and understand how many ways we have gone away from God's presence many a times. But staying away from unclean things is not just saying that stay away from all, but embrace the one that has given us the pathway to live in this life, this promise that God has given us. And I will welcome you. And you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. And after saying this, he starts chapter 7. After finishing this in chapter 6, he starts chapter 7 with the word. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, these promises that you just heard read from verse 16 and 17 and 18, that I will dwell with them, I will walk with them, I will be their God, and they will be my people, and I will welcome them. They will be part of who I am. I will be part of who they are. I will be among them. Having known these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Pursuit of holiness is full of promises. But for us to embrace, and like I said, to enjoy these benefits, to result in this pursuit of holiness, it is our responsibility to walk and keep away from all things that defile us with flesh and that of which is this world. Letting go of things that are holding us on. Now letting go of things that are holding us on and for us to live this package of promises, we, we hear this first, let go. Let go. Even the kids hear this, let it go. Some of you are just waking up, it's okay. I've heard that phrase so long in life. Having three girls, let it go was all I had. At one point I was even crying, God, let it go. It went. And now it's Moana. Anyways, some of you know that are laughing and saying amen. You know, this, this phone, this has a specific purpose that it's created for. And I use it for that. We all use it for that. Which is not just calling people. You use it for many 
specific ways it is designed. But there's this moment in life when you have these priceless moments. You want to capture it. Or you want to browse this very important page and you click on it. And then you get the message. Short in memory. No more space available. And you get so frustrated. Anybody been there before? Those who have this Google memory, you're smiling. What's wrong with you, Pastor? You don't know about that. So I try to clear space. So what I would first do is blame my ignorance. I would delete the pictures and videos. And finally, I subscribe to Google Photos. So everything's being uploaded there, right? So I would delete the pictures from my phone. Then I would still get the message, short in memory. You don't have enough space. And then I realized there is a folder, just like you see in a computer, a recycle bin. Everything you delete goes in a folder called recently deleted. If I deleted them, why are you still holding it for me? I deleted it because I don't want it. But because they hold it in the recently deleted, the memory is still being taken and you don't have the space on the phone. So, stop messing with me, Apple. I delete everything in the recently deleted folder. Yes, I have space. I keep using my phone. And I still encounter this message. No space. No memory. The worst part is when you're looking at your email, it just gets stuck. There's nothing you can do with it. It's frozen. After research and asking people, I realized the one space, the one app, the one application that takes most of the memory is your messaging. Because every time a picture or video is sent to you or you send it to somebody else, that stays there. And that carries a lot of the space on the phone. So I had to literally go back to each person on my text message list and go back to the attachments that I sent and delete it from there. And that started creating space for me on my phone. Why am I saying this? Sometimes we think letting go is just deleting the things we don't want or we don't like, but never realize that we have somehow created a recently deleted folder. We like to forgive, but it's so hard to forget. It's still there. Recently happened in my life. Oh, that brother, I forgive him. But somewhere something spurs up again. And then you hear a message, just like this, pursuit to holiness, you decide to delete everything. But again, somewhere in your life, those priceless moments of blessing in your life, something keeps reminding you, you have nothing more in your life left. You're struggling. And you don't know where to go back. Those moments, those connections, the relationship you have had with people where you still store something that somebody else told you about, somebody else might be. The different facets and avenue in your life that you have created to stay away from the promise that God has kept for each of us. Pursuit to holiness is not just God, help me God, I forgive my sins, cleanse me God. But it is a daily process as Romans 12, 1, 2 says. Daily transforming ourselves, going back, because sometimes for me it's a daily process to go back and see where I am losing my memory. Of course, there are other ways. I know you might be looking at this much smarter ways. I'm just using it as an analogy to let you understand a daily process of you have to go back and delete and wash yourself, cleanse yourselves in the word through the blood of Christ Jesus. That is honestly the pursuit to holiness. It's good to know that it's personal, it's full of promises. Lastly, why it is very more important that it is directly related to God's purpose on you. It is directly related. Whenever you pray, God, let your will be done. Let your purpose be done. I want to know your purpose and plan for me. My number one answer is you pursue holiness. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, your holiness, your sanctification. To abstain from sexual immorality or lustful things like those Gentiles would do. Like what people might define what looking cool. We have talked about this before. 
But the will of God is your holiness, your sanctification. And therefore, we continue to pursue, not take it for granted. One day I gave my heart to Christ Jesus. Everything is free, or free and clear for me. No, it's a daily process. Take the time. The world talks about moral compass. I think it was Dr. Revi Sakurai or I don't know if it was Dr. Nabil. In one of the videos, how he explains moral compass that relates directly to the source of what all moral beings is all about. And you cannot define and, de and declare any more compass by society or what the world might say because it is completely directly, just like a compass automatically points to the north direction, moral compass automatically should point the source where which all morality is based on, which is the word, which is God. And from a scriptural standpoint of what moral compass is all about, that is where you define what morality is. You come to a world where they question if there's any absolute truth or not. Again, going back, this is the source. If you deny this, everything is wrong. Everything can be done any way you want. I don't have time to say why this is right. But I hope you believe and you sang the song that I believe in God. I believe in the Father. I believe in the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Word. And having said that, if I'm directly connected to the purpose of God and me, my number one pursuit is pursuit to holiness. How do you do this? Psalm 199, simple as it can be. How can a young man keep his way pure? How can a person keep his way clear and pure? By keeping it according to your word. Psalm 199, by keeping it according to your word. This is our standard. This is our purpose in how we should follow. You know, in the, in the, in the past few weeks, I've talked to several of you and you've heard it from me. We have so many problems in our life, in our pursuit of life. We have so many needs and issues in our life. But honestly, think with me, what is the biggest problem? Family? Finance? Health? Future? Campus? School? Work? Emotional? Physical? Understand with me, every time when we say that God, you are in control, know that there is no problem that He is not aware of. God knows everything that is happening in your situation, whether it be grief or loss or pain or everything in between it. We have to truly understand when we say that God, you are in control. And in the life of pursuit of holiness, it is not easy. It is full of pressure and difficulty. But even in that, you understand that God, you are in control. Then what is the greatest problem? I'll tell you one problem that God has no control over. There's nothing that God can do about it. It is not about my sickness. It is not about my finance. It is not about my prayer request. It is not about my situation, my home, my children, my spouse, my workplace. The greatest problem that I believe is how much I have pursued God. God has no control over that. He cannot do anything about it. Only I can. When we say Romans 8.20 that all things work for good for those who love Him and call by a purpose, understand that every single thing in life is under His control, His sovereignty. Then how can I live Romans 8.28 for those who love Him and call by a purpose? That is my responsibility. That, I believe, should be the biggest problem that you and I should have in life. What have I done this morning to pursue God? What have I done to do something more, to be more closer to Him, to understand, to pursue the holiness of what Christ is because He is holy? Worship team, you can join in this morning. I want to close with this passage from 1 Peter 1, 13-16. When you and I pursue this life of being holy, knowing that it is completely meant to me personally, to follow this Christ who died for me. When I was saved from sin and enslaved to God, that I enjoy these benefits resulting in the holiness and the final outcome of eternal life for me, that it is personal and not dependent on how well my dad or mom or spouse or children or church or pastor tells me or does it or pray for me. It is up to me and my walk with God. Second, it is full of promises. It gives you a strength of hope to understand that following this path that He has promised that He will be with us. 
He will walk with us. He will dare with us when we need it. That He welcomes us with open hands and therefore live this life of holiness. And lastly, it is directly connected to the purpose of God. Every time you and I pray, God, let your purpose, let your will be done in my life, think of the moment and our path of pursuing holiness in our life. There's no way, there's no easy way to go through it without falling and embracing the word. This is the source of it all. There's no quick fix to this. How can a young man be pure? By following God's word. This is a challenge I have for you. Would you please rise up on your feet this morning? Peter writes in his first episode, chapter 1, verse 13 through 16. Therefore, therefore prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Be alert and vigilant in what you have to do. Fix your hope completely to the grace. Because there's so much that will distract you in the pursuit of holiness that you live and walk daily. But fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children. As children that respond to the commandment that the Father has given to us. Do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. I was ignorant of what I could use this phone. And I'm glad for the awareness I have. Quite often we fall ignorant of what we can embrace and enjoy by being sons and daughters of the living God. But pray that your past ignorance don't toil you and pull you away. But like the Holy One who called you, like the one who called you and chose you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, in your daily walk in your life, when no one is around you, when no one sees you, how much would you do to love God? Because when he died on the cross, his love was unconditional. Is your love just on a Sunday morning? Is your desire to pursue God just on a Sunday school classroom? Is your desire to serve God or walk in his purpose when you have family prayer or when you're with a few others? How much would you love this Jesus? How much would you take the sacrifice to pursue holiness in God's presence? That is all what we ask. Why? Be holy for I am holy. He set the example. This morning, can we take a moment to reflect, to ask God for His strength, His grace, to say, God, help me to love you. Help me to pursue that, that journey of being holy just like you. Help me to be Christ-like. Help me to live the message of the gospel in my life in a day-to-day -day basis. As the worship team leads us in a song, let's reflect on that and be in an attitude of prayer, asking God for His strength. Can we do that this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.